Today we will be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, 4 through 9. And I am reading from the New King James here. And it reads, Therefore, I'm sorry, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen and precious, chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Verse 9 and 10, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not, uh, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let us pray again. God in heaven, thank you very much again for this time, this break from uh, this, for some of us a busy week. And I just want to pray today, God that these would be your words and not mine. Again, may Jesus be lifted up. Please minister to us, speak to our hearts. Open our hearts, God, today. Uh, Draw us close to yourself. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, many of you, or some of you know, um, that a part of my experience in ministry when I was in college uh, was that I did literature evangelism. I was a call porter. Um, I actually have a partner in crime here today uh, uh, with me who used to help lead me in uh, literature evangelism. Um, but it kind of seems like no amount of uh, good training uh, could <laughs> help me uh, to be a good literature evangelist at least the time when I was going to school. Uh, I I did literature evangelism for a short while. Hillary was my leader. And uh, then I got into literature evangelism for the summer program. A good friend of mine, Uzi, was my leader. And in those months that I did literature evangelism, I learned a few things, okay? And I learned that literature evangelism is not my gift, Okay? I was not the most successful one. I might have been the most faithful. Maybe. You can ask Hillary about that. Yeah, I always showed up, even when others didn't. But I remember uh, when I went to the summer program in uh, San Antonio with my friend Uziel Maldonado, we were, it was in the heat of the summer, we were going door to door, and we would sell these books. These are some of the kind of books we'd sell, the great controversy called the mega books. And, you know, we'd ask for a suggested donation. I don't remember it was 15 or $20. You know, we'd tell them we were students and all, you know, and uh, what great, wonderful books these were. And I remember when I got into literature evangelism at, as at first, I was so passionate. I was so ready because I was a brand new Christian. I had only been baptized for a couple of years. And God had saved my life. And I wanted to tell other people. The good news. And I said, this is right up my alley. I'm going to do this. So I got out there and I did it. And I remember 
that at the end of the summer program, there was about, I don't know, 10 or 15 people, the summer program I did in San Antonio. We even had some students coming from Mexico, uh, I think from the University of Montemorelos. And, um, you know, I remember my leader, uh, Uzi, came to me at the end, and he told me, you know, he was talking a little bit about my progress uh, and my results for the summer, and he came to me and said, Adrian, you are the drop-down king. Okay, now let me explain what that means. When you go door-to-door, you usually start with like a, a health book or something, okay? And, and, and then you start with the other big spiritual books. These are the ones you really want to get out. As if you're a student trying to work your way through school, this is where they give $10, $15, $20 donations. It, and you never say uh, accept no the first time, right? And, or the second time. And if you just can't get a mega book, then you give them a little drop down. It's almost for the for the call porter evangelist. It's almost kind of an act of desperation. Please buy something, you know. But it's a there are steps to Christ. They're wonderful books, and you, they could give fifty cents or a dollar. So most of the money I made was on the drop down. Okay, <laughs> I was a drop down king. Because I was just in desperation. I couldn't sell these big mega books. But, you know, maybe they just, most of the time, I think they just wanted to get me off of their porch. Okay? So I was a drop-down king. That's how I made most of the money I made that summer. And unfortunately, of all the 10 or 15 students, I think I made the least amount. Yeah, you know, there were some students making two, three, even five, six thousand dollars. Um, I think I had like 800 bucks or something like that. So compared to everybody else. But I got an A for effort. Yes. But you know, um, that did not discourage me from continuing uh, to answer the call in my life to ministry. I knew that God had called me. But that experience helped me to understand Uh, that my true calling was not in full-time evangelism. That was my thinking when God called me to ministry. I'm going to be a full-time evangelist. But my true calling was more towards a pastoral ministry. And that experience among all the things, I I learned a lot of stuff that summer. I could go on and on. But that was one of the things that uh, I learned that summer. It helped define, it helped me to understand what my calling in ministry was as I was getting out there and doing it. And let me tell you sometimes, I hated going out and do it because I just wasn't any good. You know, I just didn't, it wasn't my thing. But it helped me to understand where God's calling in my life was at. And all of us have a calling in ministry, don't we? And some of us, we, we are challenged. We are not sure what that ministry is. We're not sure what is it that that God has called me to do. We have a passion for one thing or not another. And so, you know, God is calling all of us, just get out there. And, you know, it's good sometimes to get involved in things that you're not sure whether or not this is your calling. But to get out there, if, if you have been born again, if you want to... Tell other people about Jesus. Just get involved. And God will guide us and he leads us into what our ministries are. Amen? And so sometimes God uses those challenging experiences to teach us what our ministries are. But the Bible is very clear. Every born-again Christian who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, every Christian is a minister. Amen? Every Christian is part of a chosen generation. Every Christian is part of a royal priesthood. Every Christian is part of a holy nation. And every Christian is special to God, part of a special people that we may proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so Peter here, he's writing his letter to these uh, new Christians 
They are Gentiles, really. In what we would call today modern Turkey or Asia Minor, there's all these uh, little Christian groups that have popped up in that area. And he's writing a letter to these brand new believers. And he's using this imagery that originally comes from the Old Testament book of Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. I'm just going to read there very quickly, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. And this is where God has called his people, he's he's delivered them out of Egypt. They're at Mount Sinai now. They're supposed to be going to the promised land. And God is about to uh, speak the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. And so he says here in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, he's talking to the people, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people. There's those words, a special people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Peter being you know, a seasoned Jew. He's using this language from the Old Testament. And uh, what Peter is doing. Is he's showing that God. Now is calling the Christian church. The same way he called Israel in the past. As we know the story of the Old Testament that the Israelites who were called to be God's special people, a nation of priests, that they were not faithful to God and they wandered away from God. We're talking about that earlier today in in our Sabbath school. And so there were consequences to that. But God still has a mission. God still has a mission for the world. And when Jesus came... And he restored humanity and he reclaimed all the losses that Israel had made. One of the reclamations that Jesus made was restoring the the priesthood, if you will, to God's people. Restoring this to all Christians. And so Jesus, in his ministry, his life, death and resurrection... When we, when we become a Christian, when we identify with Jesus Christ, he elevates us to this position of a priest, of, of being part of a holy nation. And so, each one, each Christian is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is apparent in the New Testament. But what is a disciple anyway? We don't use this word much in our society today. You know, it's almost kind of like an archaic or ancient word. A disciple is first a learner or a student of someone or something else. We must all have the attitude of a learner in order to be a disciple of Christ. One of our purposes in life is to be like our teacher and master, Jesus Christ. And we learn about him from the scriptures. We learn about him from the Bible. Next, a disciple is someone who disciplines himself in order to be like his master. After all, isn't that the word disciple? As you look at it, it's very similar to the word discipline, right? So there are disciplines in life. There, there is this conformity to be like the master and like the teacher. Isn't that right? Isn't that what a true disciple is? It's, it's not conforming to the disciplines of, of, of worldly teachings or to some other a popular person or trend. No, our conformity is to that of Jesus Christ. So if we want to know what it really means to be a disciple, it's very simple. We just read the scriptures. What, what did Jesus do? What was he like? What was his mission? How did he interact with people? And how did he train his disciples to do the same? So in the New Testament, a Christian is both a disciple and a priest 
for Jesus Christ. Now, please notice that here in our text for today in 1 Peter, it does not say that you are royal priests. It doesn't use it. It says you are a royal priesthood. That means there is a fellowship of believers. And we're all together. We're all in this together. That means that not each one is out there doing his own thing apart from the body of Christ or apart from the church. We are a priesthood of believers. So it emphasizes the importance of being connected to the church and to the body of Christ as a whole. We function within the body of Christ as a whole. Now, each one has his his own special ministry. We'll we'll get to that in in a minute. But it should all take place in the context of being part of that special priesthood. As I remember one time uh, I was doing an evangelistic meeting in uh, the last district that that I was in, and um, we were we were talking about the importance of the church and the remnant church and God, you know, calling out uh, uh, people out of the world, and and He would just flat deny the necessity for uh, coming to church or having a denomination or having a church, and so you know He was just uh, against that whole thing. But, you know, and some people think this way. But the Bible tells us that we are all in this together, aren't we? And Hebrews tells us not to forsake uh, the joining together of one another. The, the, The church needs every member of the body of Christ to function right. The body needs every member to function right. And so the Bible talks about this priesthood of all believers. And as Peter is writing to the disciples here in uh, Asia Minor, he is reminding them of their priestly, uh, their priestly office and also of their kingly rank. They are not only priests, but they are a royal priesthood. That means that they have a, a, a connection somehow with the king himself. They, they are part of the family of God through Jesus Christ, which makes them the same rank as royalty. This is important. I, I want to inf- talk about this a little bit more in a minute. But Peter's point seems to be that each believer is a minister of God, because of their relationship to Jesus Christ. Because of their relationship to Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But I want to say something here. That one of the main jobs of the church, one of the main jobs of the leadership of the church, is to make disciples of Christ. Christ. That's one of the main jobs of the church, one of the main jobs of of the leadership of our church. Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus, his very last commission to his disciples, he says, go and make disciples, baptize and teach. You know, I will be with you to the end of the earth. But this is one of the main jobs of the church. And I have to say that the church in a large part, not just this church, but our denomination, many churches, in many ways we are struggling with this, aren't we? Of actually making disciples. Especially in the Adventist church, we can, we can get in the mode of indoctrinating people and expecting people to uh, practice certain lifestyles and just leaving it at that. If people are coming to church, you know, and they're keeping the Sabbath and they're paying the tithe, then they're just, they're good Seventh-day Adventists. And all those things are good. But our, our passage for today, and as you look at the New Testament of, as a whole, that being a good Christian, being a, a, a faithful uh, disciple, requires more than just those things, doesn't it? Because being a disciple, a real disciple of Christ, means so much more. It means so much more. 
And so as a church and, and as a people, we have, we, we, we've, we've come a ways, but we have much more to go. And I, as a pastor, have to take a large responsibility for that in properly discipling people for their ministries, being real, true ministers of God, every single man, uh, person. Now, here's something important. How do we become what Christ has called us to be? And this is the first step in being a priest, a disciple of Jesus Christ. The key here is the person whom we are mimicking, Jesus Christ. It is looking to Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we get distracted from doing that. We turn our eyes to other things. We turn our eyes to other problems or issues. We turn our eyes to the troubles and and the trials that are happening in our life. And it's difficult to keep our focus on the master. But this is key for being a disciple of Christ. And once we get our focus on Christ, then we can truly understand who we really are and God's mission for us. One of the most important things in order for us to live the Christian life is to understand and believe who we are in Jesus Christ. He is the foundation and the cornerstone for everything that the church does. Everything that we read here in 1 Peter chapter 2 emphasizes that very point. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church. And everything else that we are and that we do is built off of the reality of who and what Jesus Christ has done. Christ is our Savior if we, if we are born again Christians who have truly accepted Christ as our Savior, then we are different. We are different from the rest of the world. We are different from other people out there on the street. We are chosen by God himself. We are part of a royal priesthood. We are holy and separated by God and called to a special ministry. You see, the New Testament is very clear about something. It is not first about doing, but about being. It is not first about what we do. It is about who we are in Christ. I am saved by Jesus Christ. That is being. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of of Jesus Christ. I am a child of God that is on his way to heaven. And when we get that in our minds as God's people, when when we get that into our, our life, that will completely change the way that we live. I, I want to read here from Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, our, our text today. Uh, as we opened our service, Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God. And Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. John Pauline, the great Seventh-day Adventist commentator and teacher, he says this on these uh, verses. He says, as glorious as Jesus is, we can participate in that glory if we but choose to unite our lives with him. The book of Revelation, above all, is a great appeal to God's people not to be constantly looking into the things of the world, not to be stuck in the sorrow and the troubles of this world, but to lift our eyes up to see Jesus in heavenly places, 
to see that we have been elevated in these heavenly places with him. When we see this fresh status that we have in Jesus, then we can really get excited about praising him and really get excited about serving him. You know, each one of us has been called to a unique and critical role in the ministry of the church, haven't we? All of us have a unique and critical role. It's not about numbers and it's not about results. It's about serving our great high priest. It's about fulfilling the mission Jesus has given to us to make disciples of all the nations. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. It says, there are, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, For the profit of all. So I'd ask you today. Do you know what your ministry. For Christ is in the church. Do you know what that is. What what is your passion for. In the church. Now we don't have time to go over all the spiritual gifts that are listed in the Bible. But there's a number of them. And. The Bible is very clear and it teaches us that when we are doing that very thing, that life is at its best. We are are fulfilling and satisfying the purpose for our very creation. God has made each one of us unique. And I want to tell a story now about a man that maybe some of y'all have heard of or you know. Uh, His name is Nick Vujicic. He's uh, originally Australian born. He has a ministry called Life Without Limbs. Has anybody ever heard of this man before? Some of you have heard of him. Amazing ministry. So Nick Vujicic, he's he's a Christian evangelist, and he was born with a condition called Tetra Amelia Syndrome. And because he has this syndrome uh, before he was born, He was born without arms and legs, no arms and no legs from birth. And he was actually born the son of a preacher. And people would ask, how could God let this happen to, you know, uh, to this family? When he was a little boy, he was so depressed because of his uh, his condition, because of his handicap that he actually thought about committing suicide, and he attempted that in his bathtub. Uh, He was going to drown himself. And thank God, because of the love of his parents, uh, he decided not to do that. And uh, one day his mother was sharing with him the story of the man born blind, and his disciples asked who had sinned. Was it his parents, or was it him that he was blind? And Jesus said, neither. He's blind. He was born blind to show the glory of God. And Jesus healed him and gave him his sight. And, and that changed Nick's life. He gave his life to Christ and he, he offered himself completely to Jesus Christ. And to make a long story short, he has become one of the most successful Christian evangelists of our time, baptizing hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. And Nick actually came to uh, Okinawa when I was there. I uh, I knew who he was, of course, or I knew I knew of him. And so when he came, I I went with it was myself and Sumak and some other church members. We went to go see Nick preach at a stadium there in Okinawa. And you should have seen the thousands and thousands of people who came to hear this evangelist preach. Now, it is hard to get 
uh, Japanese people to come into church unless they're getting married. They use them for marriages, like the wedding ceremony, and that's it. But it's a very difficult uh, field to reach. But the thousands of people who came to hear this preacher preach, and this man was talking, of course, through a translator, and there he was. It was so packed, there was no more room in the auditorium. They had to start filling up some of the other rooms. And as Nick was preaching and giving his testimony, he said some of the most simplest, plainest truths of the Bible. But when Nick Vujicic would tell people that you are beautiful because you're made in God's image. If I were to get up here and say that, you say, Pastor, I heard it a thousand times. But when a man with no arms and no legs tells people how beautiful they are, what they were created to be in Jesus Christ, how God loves us and, 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 and brings us into his family, it was the most amazing thing. I, I can honestly say this, that when I was watching Nick with no arms and no legs, I saw probably one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen in my life. Deformed and disabled, missing body parts. But as he was preaching, I was so moved. And there was not a dry eye in the house. God used this man who had no arms and no legs to bring hundreds of thousands of people to Jesus Christ. Only God could do such a thing as that. Amen? It's amazing. Now, some of us may feel, I am deformed. I have spiritual deformities. I have, uh, you know, I'm not good at this or I'm not good at that. Uh, Pastor, I just, I don't know if I, uh, if I have any gift. I don't know if I have any passion. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm flawed. I'm, I'm this and that. Well, if a, God can use a man who has no arms and legs to bring hundreds of thousands of people to Christ, he can use you too. And he can use me. He can use anybody. The key is, what is our identity in Jesus Christ? And so that is a challenge for us today. That is a challenge for us today. And I want to end by saying this, that our church is going to try to do something different over the next 12 months. To try to help to put ministry back into the hands of of the church members. You know, as uh, in our last board meeting, we were talking about how um, we have this mindset that if we can get more and more people onto the board, then we would get more people involved in ministry. This is, at least this has been my mindset for the past 10 years in ministry. And so we talked about having a fundamental shift. Why don't we actually minimize the board and stop elevating it to the position of this high committee where people think, well, if I've made it onto the board, then I'm really a a minister. I'm really a Christian. I've really made it. No, we want everybody to have the mentality that once you've been baptized, once you've given your life to Jesus Christ, now you have arrived into ministry. Amen? And so we're, we're trying some new things in our church to emphasize the importance of everybody getting involved in ministry, not just a few. So when you receive the letters that were sent out uh, last week or this week, please take note of what's being said in those letters. Also, uh, we are going to start having more presentations and seminars for training and getting members involved in ministry. And the first one is going to take place in two weeks when I am here. And I want to encourage everybody to be a part of that. So God is calling us. He's challenging us. What is your unique ministry? And it starts with understanding your position with Jesus Christ. May God bless you and happy Sabbath. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you today for who we are in Jesus Christ and the privilege to serve in ministry with him. I want to ask and pray that you guide and lead us, Lord, as we move forward with your mission for us and for our lives and our families. And I want to ask today your blessing upon each one as we dismiss today. Thank you again. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.